trust in God still and trust in me. I think I've always had a trust problem. I think that the problem is me made rather than God made, for I am not the trusting type. It seemed appropriate, therefore, that if I was going to talk about anything during this Lent, and the only reason I might want to talk about anything is because I was asked to, and one cannot say no to Father Peter, then it might as well be about the trust problem. So let me begin with an apology. My apology before the event seeks to offset any offence I might give, any sense of being more right than anyone else, any claim to have special insight, or implied judgment on the belief that others hold, different from my own. If that might be still the case, I ask for your forgiveness in advance. I find it easy to trust when it doesn't matter, when there is nothing at stake. I remember 30 years ago going on a management course, and in the team building phase there was a trust exercise. I had to step onto a table, stand at its edge, and after other members of the group arranged themselves behind me, close my eyes and fall backwards into the safety of their arms. It was easy. That strategy of standing on tabletops and then falling backwards off them was, however, not anything I ever found particularly useful for the purpose of managing over the next 25 years. However, it didn't matter. But belief in God does matter. It has always mattered to me. It has mattered to me because I have always found it hard to fathom, found it hard to conceptualise, found it hard to quantify, found it hard to know my own mind about. I am not alone, I am sure, in feeling grateful that Thomas found his way into the New Testament. I am not sure that he comes out of it well in his exchange with the risen Christ, but it is reassuring to know for the record that doubters have a place in the scheme of things. But that story was about turning doubters into believers, and that for me is the hard bit. Let me lay my cards on the table. My wife Terry tells me I am a glass half empty person. I protested this. I am a glass full person. It is just that I have been poured into an especially large glass. Whether it is by nature or nurture, we are who we are. As Richard Rohr asserts, your life is not about you. It is about the genes you inherited, the environment and culture in which you were raised, and it is about the life circumstances which you have reacted to in a manner which no doubt in future times scientists will be able to provide a precise chemical equation for. So I am who I am. I create the world that I live in through my subjective lenses. Where some see certainty, I see uncertainty. Where some see singularity, I see multiplicity. Where some see clarity, I see ambiguity. And where some see faith, I see doubt. That is how I look at the world, whether it's politics, football or religion. So what do I trust in? Or perhaps a more relevant question to ask first of all is what do I mean by trust? Total belief is a total belief in the truth and reliability of someone or something. And that total belief is a total trust. It might be that for some, trusting is believing that someone will do something and do something that is right. The doing part of it might, however, be an unjustified extension beyond the being part. For the purpose of this talk, I want, as simply as I can, to tease out any distinction between doing and being as far as God is concerned, or more correctly, as far as I am concerned. 
no doubt for some, an important, important part of their belief system is that they trust God to put things right, to do things to make the world right. It might be that some do not believe that things will be put right in the here and now, but that they will be at the end of time, at the second coming, or on Judgment Day. In this belief system, there is a trust in a doing God. This I find hard to go along with, for reasons I will try to explain. But this is about my difficulties, my inadequate understanding, my incomplete and purely partial grasp of the jigsaw pieces that make up the picture and the meaning of life. At no time can I confidently say I am right and others are wrong. Let me try to explain then why I find it hard to trust in the God of putting things right. I accept that I might be criticised for taking an easy shot in current times. It is too soon to take stock of things, but the question has been asked, what effect has the pandemic had on religion and the nature of religious belief? It is probable that it has moved in a multitude of directions. It would be foolishly simple-minded to imagine that it has caused a crisis of confidence and an abandonment of religious faith that it has undermined religious belief across the world. For some see signs of a strengthening and a deepening of faith. But as yet, we don't know, we can't be sure. But please allow me to tell you what effect it has had on my faith. I don't know that it has had very much effect at all, because I don't think the God of doing is in play. The God of doing presents awkward questions for me. How could God let COVID-19 loose on the earth? How could God let millions die? And if this is the consequence of our own mismanagement of the earth's resources, how could the God of love let us suffer like this? Faced by an unfolding pandemic last year, I did ask these questions out of a kind of curiosity, I suppose. More, it was out of a sense of shock, I think, especially when I read last April that in the month of March alone, over 60 priests died from coronavirus in northern Italy. Now, priests are no less worthy of God's love than anyone else, but I imagined Archbishop Malcolm here in Liverpool and archbishops throughout the world where the same age profile of their priests applied, fearing that their clergy were going to be wiped out. And so they all rushed to lockdown. And the question was predictable. How could God let this happen? And predictably, I asked it. And then I tried to answer it in a prayer. I was more than prompted by the emergence of a fifth pandemic-driven theme that we here in the Archdiocese of Liverpool were asked to consider for the forthcoming Synod. How is God speaking to us through our present experience? I was reluctant to share the prayer, but I sent it to Father Peter who on first sight was underwhelmed by it, but on second sight kindly placed it within the Jewish tradition of a prayer of lamentation. I ask for your indulgence in reading it now. A prayer in despair. How is God speaking to us through our present experience, you ask? Dear God, why is it that I cannot hear you speaking to me during lockdown in the locked-in home of the woman beaten and bruised by her violent partner? In the disturbed schedule of the autistic child who craves a certain and comforting routine? In the castaway bottles of the struggling alcoholic separated from the support of her soulmates? In the empty crematorium as a loved one's coffin enters the burners with just echoes in attendance. 
in the hollow grave as a dead child is lowered before an absent grieving family, in the bed of the infected care worker gasping for breath, in the exhaustion of the doctor working an endless shift, in the pain of the nurse switching off the ventilator, in the refugee camp fighting to keep the virus out of its tents, in the bewildered gaze of the East African farmer staring at another failed crop and fearing what next with this disease. I do not hear your voice, Lord, speaking to me in any of these places. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But, my God, perhaps when you were speaking to me, I wasn't listening. Those times, and they were often enough, when you spoke and told me to look after the weak, to tend to the sick, to shelter the homeless, to feed the hungry, to protect the poor, to love my neighbour, to give up all I had so that we would build a society that cared for its weakest members, a society that promoted health and not wealth, that valued service, not profit, that sought justice in our relationships together and not power and privilege, that provided for the common good and our common home and not individual gain. If I had listened, Lord, I would not have stopped this virus, but I might have better provided for the communion of our saints, those in the National Health Service, those in our care homes, those key workers tending to the dying, keeping us alive. I might have helped them with more resources, a willingness to pay more taxes. I might have helped them with more respect for the dignity of their labour and with gratitude before the event and not after it. I might have looked further to feed the world. I might have tried harder to stop wars. I might have lived out some Christ-like values that translated into some Christ-like actions. I might have truly loved my neighbour. Oh, if only yesterday, Lord, I had listened to your voice, I would not have hardened my heart. My God, my God, why have I forsaken you? Forgive me. Oh, that today I will listen to your voice. Father Peter, as I said, out of more than kindness, I hope, placed it within the Jewish tradition of lamentation and especially likened it to Psalm 88. At this time of the year, it is truly fitting to revisit that psalm and the forthcoming Passion of Christ. It's the one psalm without any praise of God, and a psalm which those fortunate to visit the Holy Land with Father Peter will have had read to them in the pit in Caiaphas's palace. We do not need a pandemic or a war or a holocaust. Father Peter has frequently wondered how many times this psalm was read in Auschwitz to express the collective despair, powerlessness, poverty, deprivation, unkindness, loneliness that can drive the heart of the individual into the darkness of the pit. This can be a lament for us at this moment. Lord, the God of my salvation, I call out by day. At night I cry aloud in your presence. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is filled with troubles. My life draws near to Sheol. I am reckoned with those who go down to the pit. I am like a warrior without strength. My couch is among the dead, like the slain who lie in the grave. You remember them no more. They are cut off from your influence. You plunge me into the bottom of the pit, into the darkness of the abyss. 
your wrath lies heavy upon me. All your waves crash over me. Because of you, my acquaintances shun me. You make me loathsome to them. Caged in, I cannot escape. My eyes grow dim from trouble. All day I call on you, Lord. I stretch out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades arise and praise you? Is your mercy proclaimed in the grave, your faithfulness among those who have perished? Are your marvels declared in the darkness, your righteous deeds in the land of oblivion? But I cry out to you, Lord, in the morning my prayer comes before you. Why do you reject my soul, Lord, and hide your face from me? I have been mortally afflicted since youth. I have borne your terrors and I am made numb. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day they surge round like a flood. From every side they encircle me. Because of you, friend and neighbour shun me. My only friend is darkness. Well, the invocation here might be to the God of doing, to a God who will cast out the darkness, who will shine for us before the grave, before we descend into oblivion. Is that the God in whom I should trust? Clearly not at that moment for the writer of that psalm. So in place of trust in the God of doing, can I humbly suggest a trust in the God of being? God is. What is it that this God is? By his own admission, Christ declared, I am who am. I am the way. I am the truth, the way and the light. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the door. I am the true vine. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the light of the world. I don't want to be trite, but I don't hear Christ proclaiming, I am the fixer. I am the problem solver. I am the repair man. Of course, he is those things in a way, but not, I believe, in terms of a direct interventionist doing God. God has said what he is, rather than what he does. And in being the way, God shows us what to be, and thus what to do. It is for us to choose to follow that way. And so, to draw things to a conclusion, rather than an end, it is of the way of the Lord that I trust in. What then is the way of the Lord that I trust in and why? Let me simplify things by saying it is the term the way that embraces all that is the essence of the Christian life as I understand it. It can be a literal way, a path along which one might go to journey to God. Or it can be a modus vivendi, a way of living. Both apply. What is therefore the way of the Lord? Well, as I understand it, it is again, to put it simply, a life lived in the pursuit of truth, goodness and love. I hope you will allow me to represent the good news in terms of these simple but not simplistic virtues. But why do I trust in these? Again, the simple answer is that they make sense to me. And I think that trying to make sense of our lives is what we are doing all the time, with varying degrees of success. Our whole life is caught up in trying to make sense of it. We live and learn on the basis of what works for us. We commit to those things that fit into our picture of how things should be. We are different 
and we are who we are. And it is not entirely within our power to determine who and what we are. When Napoleon Bonaparte was asked if he wanted to be God, he replied, no, that would be a cul-de-sac. Some people make the pursuit of power their lives. David McClelland, an organisational psychologist trying to simplify the minefield of motivation theory, argued that there were basically three kinds of needs that motivated people and that most people had a preference for one or the other. These three drivers in people were the need for power, the need for achievement, and the need for affiliation. Obviously, most of us are mixtures of all three, but it might be we can recognise the dominance of one in ourselves over the others. No one need or drive is meant to be more virtuous than the other. But I can recognise in myself less of a drive for power and more of a drive for achievement and for affiliation. This really is to reduce one of the most complex areas of psychology to something approaching the simple. But Iris Murdoch said, we have to go from the simple to the complex, implying that nothing in life is so simple. But then she said, we have to return to the simple, meaning we need to make sense of it all and can't dwell in complexity and obtuseness. So for a simple mind like mine, perhaps psychologically attuned to the need for achievement and affiliation, a world based on truth, on goodness in people and love makes a great deal of sense. And significantly it makes sense to my heart as well as my head. What would I want to put in their place? The gospel never suggests anything other than that life will be hard and that suffering will be a part of it. Its message is counterintuitive for many in that I for one seek a life of ease and comfort. Ultimately, however, I recognise that ease and comfort are illusory. I might have at one time directed myself to the pursuit of happiness and oh that I would love to have been happy but experience tells me that happiness is a false goal. Happiness is not a goal, but a byproduct of other things. So the gospel sets out a life based on truth, on goodness and on love, I think. Out of that might come happiness, but it is better described as fulfilment and purpose and a faith paradigm that makes sense of our lives here and now or at least sense of my life. As a schoolboy, I was required to write at the top of each page, A-M-D-G, ad maiorum dei gloriam, for the greater glory of God. Saint Irenaeus asserted that the glory of God is the person fully alive. So when have I been most fully alive? Well, the truth is not as often as I should have been, but that is my problem. Christ never said it was going to be easy. Life is hard. But in the mess that is what we call living today, there is for me a route, a way I can think of taking, a way of truth and light a light that can dispel the darkness of the pit. That light glows when I am with people who have committed their lives to the search for truth and not covered themselves in deception or their own glory. It glows when I see people driven by the goodness of their hearts to help others, even at cost to themselves. And it shines brightest in those who so love the poor and the weak the despised and the rejected in our society, that prejudices crumble before them. This makes sense to me. It is reinforced by all that I do and think. None of it grates, none of it diminishes me or other people. 
I trust it because it works for me. I do not need God to do things to be magical or miraculous for me to trust in her or him. The magic is in the being, in the word of God. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All that came to be had life in him, and all that life was the light of people, a light that shines in the dark, a light that darkness could not overpower. I don't need God to cure the world of COVID. I don't need God to reverse climate change. I don't need God to feed the world. It is for humans to get on with those things, guided by the good news that we are loved, that we are fully alive when we love our neighbour as God loves us, and that God has made his temple in us, driving us to find a cure for COVID, to feed the world, to end wars, to tackle climate change. That search for truth, for a life-seeking goodness, finding inspiration in the goodness of others, and finding love in our hearts, is the only way I can make any sense of the mess that we call life. And that is my little miracle, that I have found my God. So, I trust in God still. <laughs>